Greetings, BUSN 1360 Software Apps for Business students. I'm Dr. McGrory, and today we tackle the Excel Chapter 2 Grader. So let's get started because there's some things that you want to know as you begin this grader. The first thing is how important it is that you are using the most current version of Word, Excel, PowerPoint for this class. So we are using Excel 2021. If you talk about Office 365 or Excel 365, all that indicates that you're on a subscription model. So the current version is 2021. Now, in this particular grader, as we arrive at step 14, they're going to introduce a function. We're going to explain it. We're going to go through it. And the function is called X lookup. This is a new function that became available with this most current version. It's very powerful. I like it a lot. If you have any familiarity, you may remember VLOOKUP, which still exists, but the XLOOKUP function is much more powerful. It's not in the older versions. So if you are using an older version of Excel or you know Office as you're going through this class, then you're going to find that step 14 you're not going to be able to complete it, which also means step 15 and 16 uh, are going to be impacted by that. And then there's 17 steps in our grader today. S step 17 is submit. I would hate for you to just say, well, I'm going to lose the points. I don't want you to do that. I want you to learn and I want you to maximize your points. So what are your options? Well, one is that you can go to this office.com website log in with your Southwest username and password. You can then in the right corner of the page that you arrive at after you log in, you'll see a button to download and install. Works on a Mac, works on a PC. So you can download and install the software. It will remain active for as long as you are a student at Southwest. Consider going ahead and doing that, installing that software. Now, what other things can you do? When you log in to that office.com website, you may notice that there are icons to directly open Excel, Word, PowerPoint, for example. I want you to be very careful with this because these are not real Excel, Word, PowerPoint. What do I mean by it? they're not real? They are web-based versions, and so they are great when you are collaborating and sharing documents with people and just need to make little edits. But they are not as powerful as the software that you would, for example, install directly on your computer. I could ask you, for example, what's the difference between going to a website and using an app on your phone? And you may say, oh, the app, the app has special features. I can do more with the app. Yes, because it's installed, isn't it? It's installed on your phone. With that same model, using that as an example, Excel, when it's installed on your computer, has great, powerful functionality capabilities. The web-based version is not going to be as powerful. But with that said, if there's just a step or two that you need to complete, consider going to the website to see if you can open that document in the website, complete that one step, and then save it back and continue on. Okay, so that's just an option. You can install the software. You can try the web-based version. That's going to be complicated for a lot of students. So what are some of your other options? Well, don't forget that you have that Southwest laptop loan program where you can borrow for free. All of these things are free that I've talked about, where you can borrow for free the Southwest, a Southwest laptop It'll have the software installed on it, and you can complete your work. So I hope you're thinking about that, because that is going to help you complete your work and maximize your points. What else can you do? On campus, yes, on campus, we have computers in the library. We have computers in the academic support center. And I can kind of hear that some students might be saying, but I prefer to work at home. I understand that. So why don't you complete as many steps as you can working at home, stop by campus, use the computers, complete the steps that you need to complete to maximize your points. That's not just for this assignment, this grader, that's for other graders. 
I really hope you'll consider installing the software, but definitely using the most current version of the software. And hopefully this will help you to do that. These are all free resources that support your success. All students, even if you're using the most current version of the software, what I want you to understand is that I am not perfect and you are not perfect. And we will make mistakes, not just in this class, but on the job. And that especially happens when we are working with formulas and functions uh, in Excel. And troubleshooting is a part of this learning process. We have to be able to do that. So we can learn to fix our mistakes to promote our success in class, in other classes, in, you know, in our profession, on the job. We want to be able to say, oops, made a mistake. Let me look at this, recognize that I've made a mistake, realize what that mistake is, and then fix it, right? So troubleshooting means just that. Identify the error and correct it. We learn. You have to be patient with yourself, okay? Be, you're going to make mistakes, and it's real easy to say, oh, that computer, I did everything right, because none of us intentionally do it wrong, right? We do the steps thinking that we've done them correctly. So we have to just pause and say, well, something must be wrong. wonder what it is that's wrong here. So embrace that. It's okay to embrace that. When you, you know, kind of look at it and really learn from the class and take what you've learned and apply it, you're going to increase your knowledge. That's going to help you um, troubleshoot these mistakes. But you also have to have great attention to detail. Did the formula start with an equal sign? Did you put parentheses where you needed parentheses? Did you have spaces where you shouldn't have, right? Um, you know, just little things that can cause an error in Excel. Some of this is about overcoming fear, anxiety, frustration. Be patient with yourself and just say, you know what, there's a little problem here. Let me look at it. I can figure this out. You can figure this out. This, this is how we all learn. And so, you know, we're going to go through this together. I want you to feel supported. Last note before we absolutely jump into the assignment. I'm going to post these links in the comments because I think you will find them very helpful. One is a list of commonly found errors in functions and formulas. And the other includes a detailed description page from GoSkills.com. But on this GoSkills page, there is this video. So again, I'm going to put these links in the comments of the video. But it's such a great demonstration and explanation of this new function. So as we get started, because troubleshooting errors is such an important skill that you're going to learn, I'm, I'm not going to look at these other pages, but I do want to look at this together with you. Notice six most common Excel errors. What does that tell us? That tells us that we're all going to experience errors. And that's okay, because we're going to solve those errors together. I'm trying to make this bigger so that you can see this. The first thing that you're going to see is what is not an error. So notice, this is a great demonstration picture here. Do you see that in this picture of cell A2 that there are the, what do we call those, hashtags, pound signs, number signs. So whenever you see these hashtags lined up, that's actually not an error. That simply means that the column is not wide enough to display the data. So remember our little savvy Excel user tip? When you click on the cell, you look in the formula bar. So what does this tell us? It tells us that there is a number, there's a value in that cell. The reason that Excel won't simply display the number when there's not enough room to display the number is because it would have to chop off some of these digits, which would give the impression that this was not big of a number. So what is this? Um, when we see there's three, what is this, 15 million? What if it chopped off some of those zeros and made it look like 15,000? That would be grossly different than 15 million. So instead of misleading you, Excel fills up that cell with pound signs, hashtags. Not an error, just means that the column width is not wide enough. So what else? What if you see this? Now this is a hashtag, but it's followed by a word and a question mark. 
you're going to see this as, as a theme when there's a true error. So here it says there's a problem. And you'll notice Excel is like giving you a warning sign and sometimes you can get help clicking on that icon. But it says name, name, name. I don't understand the name. And when I look in the formula bar, it looks like I have misspelled the word sum. So once we fix that spelling error, this, this message will go away and it will work correctly. So we have to troubleshoot. We have to look at it, identify the error. Oh, I was trying to sum. I just miss, you know, forgot to put the M or mistyped. I have a typo. Fix that typo and the error will go away. But name means Excel is not able to recognize that function. Value, look at this. Now here it's not even a question mark, it's an exclamation point. Value, you know, Excel is outraged, right? Value, I don't know what this means, value. Well, look at what we're telling Excel to do. So again, clicked in the cell, looking at the formula bar. So they're adding here and they said, all formulas start with an equal sign, A1 plus A2 plus A3, so far so good, plus A4. Well, ABC, how do we add ABC? That doesn't make sense. That's text. It's not an appropriate value to be adding. And so Excel says, this is a problem, value. Now again, notice that when it's all those hashtags, it's not an error. When it's filled with hashtags, just means the column's not wide enough. But when I see one of these words, Excel is truly trying to explain to me what the problem is. Is it that I don't recognize the name? Name? Right? Or is it that I don't, this is not a proper value? That's, you know, really a statement. So let's look at a couple more. Look at this one. This is both a question mark and an exclamation point. We really have some problems here. Okay, so I look at the formula. Now, the, again, the formula, kind of like in the, the previous error, the formula looks okay. It's only when I start to look at the values, right? That's when I realize the problem. So you see how this troubleshooting is more than looking just at the cell. We have to look at what's going into that. So it says, hashtag, just one hashtag, div zero, you know, outrage, right? It's outraged by this. Well, you know, we know that you cannot divide by zero. And probably what happened throughout the, the working with this spreadsheet is maybe this value is also a formula. So maybe A4 is the result of um, saying uh, retail price minus cost. And maybe something has happened where we are breaking even. So whatever we're selling it for minus the cost, you know, through, over time has changed where this is zero. Now that this is zero and Excel is trying to do some calculation here, we end up dividing by zero. That's not good. So that's an error. And we would have, it doesn't mean the formula is wrong. It means we have to figure out what's wrong with A4. Why would we be trying to do this? But the purpose of this error, div zero, is communicating to you, you're dividing by zero. The common reaction is, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. And that's when you have to say, well, apparently I am. So I need to figure out what's, what's going on. Again, push back from the fear and frustration. Okay, I gotta look at this. Okay, let me figure it out one step at a time. That's the self-talk, okay? Let's look at another one, null. What is null? Well, <clears throat> this is, it says one of the most common types of errors, so we wanna pay attention. When you forget to separate two cell references correctly, then you, re then you shall receive, you shall receive this error. In the uh, below mentioned example, there's no co uh, command between A4, they say A4 and A4, they, they made a mistake, A4 and A5, right? So. It just doesn't know what to do. What it says, what what are you what are you talking about here? So again, we know we have an error there. Even if you don't remember, like what exactly does that mean? It means you got to take a look at that formula, figure out what's going on. Let's look quickly at another one. Reference. When your formula contains some incorrect cell reference, then you 
you shall see a reference error. This mainly happens when you mistakenly delete a column or row. In the example below, you will see that your data is perfectly filled without any error. Okay, so here they're not even showing that. Um, it says, but if by chance I delete the third row, okay, so what was three, 863? Notice that that's gone now, so it shifted all of this up. We'll look at what happened to our formula. The formulas will adjust automatically, but the problem is a minute ago we had one, two, three, four, five things to add up. Now we're adding up only one, two, three, four things. And so it didn't know how to update that formula and remove one of the items. It got confused. You're, you know, if you ask me, I think this is the most common error that you're going to see. Just know that there's something wrong with that formula. It says, I'm not referencing your data correctly. You're going to have to look at it. You're going to have to look at what's going into it and make any updates that you need to make. That's what you need to understand from that. Okay, so lots more uh, information that you can get from this page, but I wanted you to understand that you will, you absolutely will experience errors. We're going to troubleshoot. It's helpful to understand what some of these uh, messages from Excel mean, but you're going to get them. I make mistakes. You make mistakes. We all make mistakes. We're just going to work through them. Give yourself the patience to do that. You're going to have to look at the formula and what's going into the formula and correct any errors. Don't be afraid to do that because this is something you're going to do uh, throughout your work with Excel and, and it's okay. It's okay, it makes you a power user. With that, let's jump in. Now, I have uh, already, uh, I'll go put this, already organized, downloaded and organized my files into my folder as we always say. In this case, I have two files. I've opened up the instructions. We know that step one is gonna tell us to open up the Excel file. And so I have already done that. Looking at the instructions, as I've already mentioned, we have 17 steps. It sounds shorter, but we are working with functions and formulas, so there's going to be some things to explain and a lot to learn along the way. So I've zoomed in on my instructions. Here they are, and I want you to start by reading the project description. This is great because this talks about a mortgage company that is interested in purchasing homes or looking at the loan amount. How much do you need for the down payment? Will you have to pay uh, insurance, which if, if you can't come up with enough money for a down payment, a certain amount, then you end up having to pay some insurance because the bank is worried that if the house burns down before you pay it off, right, they want to make sure that they have some protection, so you pay for that. And we're going to go through and calculate these values. Now, as we do this, don't stress. Don't stress at all because Excel is going to do the math. And what you're going to learn is that Excel has some math built into it that's going to do all the work for you. We're going to walk through it one step at a time. We have already completed step one. We've opened the instruction file. We've opened our Excel file with our name. So we're going to consider Excel step one complete. On to step two. You would like to create a formula to calculate the amount financed for each loan. So if we need a you know, loan, we're the bank maybe, we're going to give a loan to buy a house. We need to have a formula to calculate the amount that is being financed, right? So we're going to enter a formula in cell D8 to calculate that. And then we're going to copy that formula to the rest of column D. So let's look at our Excel spreadsheet, figure out what's going on. Notice in our Excel spreadsheet, we have two tabs. Make sure you are on the details tab. You can take a sneak peek at the payment info. We've got some work to do there, but we're gonna start, let me click on details. We're gonna start on this details tab of our workbook. They're talking about column D. And if I look, I have a loan number, I have the cost of the house, and I have how much somebody has come up with for the down payment, right? So how much, if this is a $400,000 house and they've come up with an $80,000 down payment, how much will they need for the loan? Well, don't we just need to say 400,000 minus 80,000? So all formulas start with an equal sign. 
That puts me in calculator, zzz, right, the power of the math mode here in Excel. We're going to click on house cost minus down payment. Once I'm comfortable that that formula looks good, I'm going to press the Enter key. That moves me down one cell. But I know that I need to copy this formula, so I could have hit you know, Control Enter to stay on that cell. I'm going to click it to move back up to it because I'm about to copy it. Now, what is my expectation? Um, this is now a hugely important question. What is my expectation, your expectation, when you copy this formula? Right now, it says B8 minus C8. And don't you expect that each of these numbers, 8, you know, B8 and C8, will change to B9 and C9 when you copy it to the next row, and that it'll change to B10, C10, B11, C11. Do I think it will do that? I do, because that's what Excel always does. So let's go ahead and copy that down. I've, over the fill handle, press and drag that powerful black plus sign. That means you're over that fill handle, and release. What does that savvy Excel user do? They click inside the cell. They look in the formula bar to make sure it copied correctly. In other words, no errors. Why do we check for errors? Because we anticipate that we're going to have them. So we always check. Save that. Let's go back to the instructions. Step three, you would like to create a formula to calculate the monthly interest rate per period for each loan. So it tells us enter uh, in formula, enter in formula, enter a formula in cell F8 to calculate the monthly interest rate for the first loan. We want the monthly interest rate. Don't they usually give us interest rates as they'll say a, this the APR, the annual percentage rate, right? So if they say 12% interest rate, then that means for the year. But if it's a monthly interest rate, then if it's 12% for the year, it'd be 1% each month, correct? Okay, so that's what they're talking about. Add the appropriate, uh-oh, now this is from your ebook, from your reading. It's saying an absolute cell reference. Now what does that mean? That means that a minute ago in step two, when I copied that formula, I expected I demanded that Excel change those row numbers as it moves down. If I had copied you know, left and right, I would have expected that Excel would change the column reference. But when we say it's an absolute cell reference, what we're saying to Excel is do not change the row, do not change the column, right? That's absolutely stick to that cell. Okay, so that's what they're saying there. Add the appropriate absolute cell reference for cell uh, B5. They're even telling us which one's going to be absolute. Then use the fill handle to copy to the rest of column F. So let's go back to Excel. And I'm going to zoom in so that we can see a little better. So here we are. And in column F8, it's telling us we need to, let's see, calculate the monthly interest rate. So let's look at cell E8. This is the mortgage rate. And let's look at cell B5. It says payments per year. And there's tw 12 payments per year because we're going to pay monthly. Now, you could pay twice monthly. That'd be 24, right? So it just depends on your payment schedule. And they've typed this as a value on the worksheet because the anticipation is that it may change. Isn't this the scenario? You're talking to a banker, you are the banker, and you're talking to a customer. And you say, you know what, this is how much you're going to have to pay every month. And they go, ooh, ooh, uh, I need to pay that perhaps a little more frequently. You know, I, I, I don't want to pay one big lump sum every, you know, two months. So I want to pay every month. I, I get paid, you know, twice a month, so I want to make sure I have that scheduled. So they keep changing the number of payments per year. You don't want to have to recalculate all your formulas and update them with this new their 12 payments. So instead, 
you type it on the worksheet so that you only need to change it on the worksheet and all your formulas that reference this value, they will update. This is a key consideration in Excel. You want to put your values, even if you think they are somewhat static, you want to put them on the spreadsheet so that you can easily update them and that will flow through to your formulas. We're going to see what that means. Here we go. So in cell F8, uh, all formulas start with an equal sign. I'm going to start with my mortgage rate, right? There it is, 3.625, and I'm going to divide by cell B5. What is that going to I'm going to hit enter. And what does that tell me? That's the rate per period. Well, I said I'm going to pay 12 times per year. So this is an annual mortgage rate percentage, and I've broken that down according to the number of payments. In essence, it's monthly. Okay? So it's 0 0.302. This is my, not my APR, this is my MPR, right? My monthly percentage rate. Now, I want you to think about this. Clicking on this cell, E8 divided by B5, what happens if I copy this? Is it ready to be copied? Well, if I put my, you know, get that powerful black plus sign, I got that fill handle, press and drag. Oh, goodness. Aren't these the errors that I thought? And, and what about these two? That does not pass the common sense check, does it? It shouldn't be zero. We know it's not going to be a zero. They're not giving us the house for free money, right? Not giving us that money for free. We learned divide by zero. How can we be, what? Divide by zero value. We saw that one. I don't understand the value. Okay, let's investigate. We, the first formula looked good to us. E8 divided by B5. And we know it's always going to be whatever's in B5, right? But if I click on the next formula, it's E9. Okay, that's good. And look at this. If I click inside the formula, do you see how Excel spots those cells and it tells you? So E9, that one was good. I wanted Excel to go from E8 to E9. But it moved down to a cell with nothing in it. Now, I can simply press the escape key on my keyboard, or if you want to click the X, either one of those will work. So in essence, I'm dividing by zero because there's nothing in cell B6. And I never wanted it to divide by B6. I wanted it to divide by B5. What's going on here? We're troubleshooting now. That's what we're learning. So in cell F10, it says E10. Again, I'm going to click here. Oh, goodness, look at that. This one is correct, and it's trying to divide it by house cost. Remember the example we looked at, ABC? Well, <laughs> how do we divide by house cost? That doesn't make any sense. And that's why Excel said, value, value, error, error. It's a problem, right? So we have got some fixing to do here. You know, we can continue on by the time we get to this one. You know, this is, this is, these are the errors that are very easy to um, overlook because you got a result. You received an answer. But what sense does that make? 2.5 divided by 400,000. Well, it's probably not absolutely zero, but by the time you get to a value, it's so many points past the decimal, you know, by 400,000. My goodness. Same thing here. It just continued. So it did, Excel did, what we told it to do. It took this formula, and as we copied it, it changed to be relative to the new position. So instead of E8 relative to, you know, one row down, it became E9. But it also became B6. Now, folks, here this is important. You may think that you need to fix these formulas. That's not true. The error is in the first formula. So go back to the first formula. Remember I asked you, is it ready to be copied? It's not because we know that cell B5 needs to be locked down. Now, you, the shortcut key for this is F4 on your keyboard, but a lot of students struggle with that because 
uh, those those function keys F1, F2, F3, F4 um, often on your laptop require that you hold down function keys that kind of thing. Um, so what you can do is just click before the B in B5 and type a dollar sign. Now that's uh, part of a, a absolute reference. It's not a full. When we say absolute, we mean that the column needs to be locked down, but the row also needs to be locked down. That's what makes it absolute. It seems weird to interrupt a cell name. Like you wouldn't think you could take B5 and put a dollar sign right in the middle of B and 5. That seems weird. That's exactly what you do. So there's two dollar signs in an absolute reference one before the column and one before the row. Keep that in mind, press enter. That value did not change, but the formula is now ready to be copied. So now when I get my fill handle, powerful black plus sign, and I start to drag it down, oh, so much better. Overcame that fear, that anxiety, took a moment to look at those formulas, realized, that this first formula was not set for an absolute reference, fixed it, copied it, have some values that look like they could be monthly percentage rates, right? It looks much more reasonable. Whew. Good job, folks. Save that. Let's go back to the instructions. That was step three. Let me scroll up. Let's look at step four. For step four, it says that you would like to calculate the total number of payment periods for each loan. To complete the task, you will use a mixed cell reference. Okay, if an absolute cell reference means that there's a dollar sign before the column and a dollar sign before the row, so two dollar signs in an absolute, then a mixed cell reference will have one dollar sign. Where does that one dollar sign go? It depends. Are you trying to lock down the column and say the column can never change? Or are you trying to lock down the row and say that the row should not change? Let's look and see. You will use a mixed cell reference as an alternative to an absolute cell reference. Enter a formula in cell A H8, excuse me, H8, to calculate the total number of payment periods per loan. Use an appropriate mixed cell reference for cell B5. So they're telling us which one is going to be uh, mixed. Then use the fill handle to copy the formula down. Okay, so I'm just going to say this. If we're going to copy the formula down, what's going to be changing? The row or the column? The row, right? It goes from like B5 to B6 to B7. So what am I going to need to lock down? the row. So I will not, for a mixed reference, I will not need to put the dollar sign before the column, just before the row. So let's do that. Let's go back to our Excel spreadsheet. And where are we supposed to be working in uh, H8? This is the number of payment periods, right? So I got to do some math. All formulas start with an equal sign. And then we need to say where is it? G8. This is the number of years. Now, if we're going to pay monthly, isn't that simply going to be the number of years times the number of payments per year? So I'm going to multiply. That's our star, right? And what am I going to multiply by? B5. Now, stop and think. I could hit enter and we could do the troubleshooting and all that, and, and you might find that you do, do that by mistake. But if I stop and think, I'm going to copy this, and I know that G8 is going to change to G9, to G10, to G11. I'm okay with that because I need it to do each one of these years. But this one I need to lock. The instructions said don't do absolute, do mixed. Okay, so we've discussed that it's the row. See what I did there? Press enter. Now, I mean, I think that's right. I don't do anything because I think it's wrong. So I'm going to copy it, but I'm going to check it. Autofill handle. These look reasonable. What is that savvy Excel? You see why they do this? They click. Is it still B5? It is. Click. Is it still B5? 
So you understand. Now you start to get the inside scoop on what these Excel people that you may work with, how they're clicking, but they're looking and why they're looking. Save that. Let's go back to our instructions. That was step four. On to step five. For step five, it tells me um, you should calculate the total value of the homes being financed. Uh, use AutoSum in cell B16 to calculate the total value of all homes sold. Okay, so let's go back to Excel. And they're telling us that this is going to be um, in, like to calculate, um, in B16. Oh, okay, so see down here, they've got a little spot for us house cost, but it does say total. So they want to know, let me make sure I'm reading this right, total value of the homes, okay, of the homes being financed. So they want to know this total cost. Now, they said to use auto sum. Okay, so auto sum, some of you may be familiar with. I've clicked in this cell, and I'm going to go up here to the auto sum button. See it? If I click squarely on that button, it is, we are seeing, kind of for the first time, a function. Now let's break this down. All formulas, if I go into math mode, start with an equal sign. And do you see that it filled that in for us? I can look up here or I can look down here. The name of the function, what is a function? A function is a pre-built program that makes you faster by saving you some steps. Adding is something that we do a lot. So instead of selecting each and every value and putting a plus sign, this, plus, that, plus, this, plus, that, what if we had to sum a thousand values? That would be a lot of extra work to put a plus sign. So sum says just tell me, tell me what it is that you're going to sum. And that's how a function works. It has a keyword, which is the program name, sum, and then it has parentheses. Look carefully at those parentheses. Do you see a space between the word sum and the parenthesis? You do not. Never put a space, never put a space between the word and the parenthesis. It's right together, okay? So no spaces. So what goes inside those parentheses? In this case, whatever we are summing, okay? Remember, our, <clears throat> excuse me, our syntax the starting point, in this case B8, a colon, that's the two dots, means through. So B8, now wait a minute, let me look at this, B8 through B15, wouldn't that mean that I am summing house cost? Now, I'm going to tell you something. If you go ahead and accept this, I'm just going to press enter, Excel will ignore this in as part of the um, auto sum. It's almost a little too smart for its own good. Uh, I have to be careful about that because as I continue to build this table and maybe even this table, Excel may pick up values that I did not intend, okay? Because it's really included too much. Even though I'm getting an answer, it's just bad form. I'm going to go back to this cell and I'm going to show you how to do it correctly. I'm going to press delete. I'm going to once again press on my auto sum button and you see the marching ants. Remember we talked about marching ants? Ignore them. It is a suggestion. Ignore it. What is it that I want? Press and drag. Do you see how I just paid no mind to what it was already selecting? I just did what I wanted. I pressed and I drug. So you can do that. Just tell Excel, look, I'm not paying attention to you right now, Excel, because you're wrong. So I'm going to do what I want to do. Press and drag. That's all you got to do. Now that you've got it in there, that is correct. B8 through B12, just press your Enter key. Now, what if you messed up and you said, oh, I just can't get that selection correct? Okay, click on the cell. Can't you edit a formula? I know you can. You put your mouse right up here, you click. If you need to change that cell reference and instead of B15, just delete the five and put a two, you can do that. So you can make edits even though it's a function. Don't be scared of that. Save that. Let's go back to our instructions. So here we are, we just finished step five 
on to step six. It says you would now like to calculate the average of all homes being purchased, okay? Um, let's do that. I'm in cell B17. Once again, I'm going to go to my auto sum button, but notice this little drop down arrow next to it. Click on that. And here I have more commonly used functions and average is one of them. So I'm going to pick that. Now look at it really guessed incorrectly this time. It just saw the number next to it and it said, you want me to average this one number? No. So let's go back to house cost, select it. If, if I'm on my keyboard, I can press enter. Since I'm using my mouse, I can just click that check mark, that green check mark. Now, you're checking this to say, is this kind of reasonable? If I look at this, would I agree that this is probably an average of that? Yeah, makes sense. You can guess what some of our next steps are, right? Let's go back to, the, oh, let's save that. Back to the instructions. So that was step six, on to step seven. Uh, you'd like to calculate the median of all homes. Let's do that. I'm gonna click in cell B18. I'm gonna go back to auto sum, but instead of clicking squarely on the button, I'm gonna use that drop down box right now. Uh oh, I don't see median, average, count, max, min, but I do see more functions. Click on that. I love this box. This, folks, is an example of something that works a little better when Excel is installed on your computer than it does in that online web-based version we were talking about. So what am I trying to do? Notice that in the top part here, it actually says type a brief description of what you want to do and then click go. And it's already selected. So if I start typing, it's going to delete that and put whatever I'm trying to do. Well, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to find the median. So I'm typing that in. I can either click go or hit enter. And Excel looked through and it found several functions. But when I click on this median, kind of the obvious answer, right? Look down here, returns the median of the number in the middle of the set of given uh, numbers. Don't you wish you had this when you were taking Math 1530, right? The uh, probability and statistics or introduction to statistics. Median, okay, now there's different ways to calculate median, so be very careful when you do that. But yes, Excel does this kind of stuff because business people do this kind of stuff. So click OK. And now look at this. I love this. We're going to learn about this box as we continue throughout this grader. It's saying, give me each and every one of those values. Well, why would I do that? That's ridiculous to have to type all those things in. So I want you to do this. Notice that this first cell is selected. Um, if it's not still selected, make sure you delete whatever is in there. I'm going to just move this box to the sides. If it's over the top of my information, move it. See how I just grabbed it by this title bar? I'm pointing to the middle of the title bar of that dialog box. And in this first area, I'm just going to press and drag. Did you see what I did? And do you see what Excel did? Okay. In other words, Excel is saying, give me each and every value, and I'm suggesting you start with B17. I just deleted that to show you again. Now, your book probably tells you to collapse the box. See how here's the little box. It just collapsed. And then after you pick the values to come back here and expand the box, well, you can certainly do that. But it's much faster, much more efficient. If you're just make sure you are clicked where you want the data to go, that range to go press and drag. And you see it did the collapse and expand automatically. It, it knows it needs to do that. Now let's look at what it's telling us. It's listing all those values and I need to make, you know, just spot check. Does that look good? It's already telling us the answer. So we can say, is that reasonable? I want to make sure that that's reasonable. If I feel good about that, I don't, I don't have to give it a second value. How do I know that? Because this is bolded and this is not. When you see that once something is bolded, one of these uh, parameters is bolded, you have to provide a value for that. If it's not, it's optional. Click OK. There we go. Does that look like a midpoint? Like that value could be the midpoint. Yeah, I would agree with that. Save that. Gosh, 
we're learning all kinds of stuff. We learned that there's more functions that we can go into and how Excel will try to help us with those functions. Not only does it type in the word. Are you, have you been looking at this? Here's, here's the program for that. It's called Median. All formulas start with an equal sign. The formula, the, the program name is called Median. And it, all functions have parentheses. And inside those parentheses, we tell it what to act on. And we tell it any information that the program needs. Okay, That's been true for Median. That's true for Average. So sometimes we need to use this button. Over time, you kind of learn to type these. Oh, okay, it's average. And you just type it. Open parenthesis, close parenthesis, right? Guess where we're going next. So go back to our instructions. And that was step seven on to step eight. You'd like to display the cost of the least expensive home. Now, if I use words like least, it becomes harder for me to learn Excel because I'm not speaking Excel. And part of this is you are learning Excel and Excel is kind of teaching you how to talk. I equate this to Starbucks. If you've ever gone to Starbucks, you may say, I would like a small coffee, one tall coffee. And I know the first time I was, I was like, I said small. Did she hear me say small? But what she was doing, the barista, is she was teaching me how to order at Starbucks. Use the word tall. If you want a large, uh, I'll say I would like one large coffee, you, a venti. I, was, uh, I don't know. Is it a venti? Now I, I, I need a venti. I need a tall, right? Because they've taught me the language, right? So this is where you need to kind of learn the Excel language. If it is the least expensive, it is the most minimum of the cost. Anything that is least is minimum. Try to make that translation in your mind because then when you go to Excel, we're going to go to Excel, and it says lowest, you're thinking lowest. No, that's not right. Minimum. Minimum. So you go to your auto sum, you look for your most common functions, and you see min. And min sounds like minimum. You're kind of looking ahead. Doesn't that sound like maximum, minimum, and maximum? So not least, not lowest, minimum. Speak their language. Not, not small, but tall. Not large, but venti. Not least, but minimum. There we go. Now again, it guesses incorrectly. I'm just going to ignore that. I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to select what I want. Does it look good? I can either press enter, or do the check mark. Take a moment to look. All formulas, any math starts with an equal sign. Even if I do 20 more things up here, it's, I have to have a just one equal sign, always at the very beginning, and only one. Okay? Then for now, only one. What is the name of the program that I'm running? Min. And it's going to look at what? It's going to look at B8 through B12. That's inside of parentheses. There's no space between the word men, the program, and the beginning of that parenthesis. Looks good. Let's go back to our instruction because we are finished with step eight on to page two, which is step number nine. You would like to display the value of the most expensive home. Not most, max. What is the maximum price? Go back, not highest, max. Go to my auto sum. There's max. Not that. Ignore that. Select the range that you want. And you can either hit the enter key on your keyboard or you can do the uh, check mark. By the way, that red X is not delete. It just means escape. Okay, it just means escape. So you the uh, instead of red X, you can hit escape on your keyboard. I haven't saved, but I need to save. Looking ahead, number of mortgages. In other words, how many homes are we financing here, giving a mortgage to? Let's go back to our instructions. Step 10, you'd like to determine the total number of homes financed. You want to count. So let's go back to Excel. And if I select these, notice, and that is selected, right? Under house co uh, cost, I've selected B8 through B12. Look down here. Look in your status bar. It says average, count, and sum. So very quickly, 
Excel is giving information that you might be asked for. If you don't see all of these, I think you can just right click. Yeah. Woo. If I right click on that status bar, um, uh, there's lots of options in terms of what I can display. So if you're not seeing all these, but you should see these by default. Whatever I have selected, it's going to tell me the average, it's going to tell me how many items, and it's going to tell me the sum. So if I did, you know, the amount financed, here's where this is great. Your boss calls you. You pick up the phone. He says, how much are we financing? You're like, I don't have that on my spreadsheet. Oh, um, we're financing this month uh, 1228200 oh, Okay, how many was that? Now, I mean, it, with five, you might be able to look at this and go one, two, three, four, five. But it, but you want to make sure you're accurate. And if you had 20, if you had 1,000, sometimes it gets harder to do that count. You select it. You look down there. You're like, it's this many. So you look really sharp, right? You even see the average. These, this is great information to have at a glance. Combine this with some other skills that you know. You say, well, um, what about uh, the three houses that are going to be bought by the Smith family? Maybe they're independently wealthy. I don't know. So you pick the first one. You hold your control key down. You pick that one, skipping the second one. Uh, control key still held down. Pick that last one and look at that three are selected. Here's the sum of just those three. That was using my control key. Remember how we said it can select non-adjacent cells? Look at you. You're looking sharp. Okay. We are being asked, though, with this step to count the number of mortgages. So I am going to click in cell B21, go back to my auto sum button. Now, I want to point out that this is very specific. It does not say count. It says count numbers. Excel has two different functions. One is going to be used to count numbers. Another one is going to be used to count what we would call alpha numerics. So in other words, both alphas, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, text, as well as numbers. So we're just counting numbers right now. Very important. Let's click that. And look at saying count this. No, ignore that. Select what you want. And I'm going to click the check mark. Sure enough, it says five. Now look at this. The counting function is, is simply count, but it only counts numbers. So you may be wondering how do you count alphanumerics? Well, let's just do this as a demonstration. If I come up to my auto sum and I know I need something else, more functions. Oh, I'm sorry. It's trying to help me with the current function. So let me go to the cell below. That's kind of cool to know, though. You can use that more functions uh, to get help on that. If I click in cell B22, I go to sum, to auto sum, and I choose more functions. And I know I want to count, but I want to count something with, you know, alpha, alpha numeric. What if I just said count and then Huh, okay. Well, look at this next one down. And it's count A, not count. Look how many count functions there are. Well, count A counts the number of cells in a range that are not empty. So that's good to know as well, right? That's good to know as well. If something's empty, it's not going to count the cells. It's only counting them if they have something in it. Um, so it doesn't matter what's in it, and that function would be called count A. So you can learn functions using that more function uh, term, tool, that more function tool. You just have to kind of search, and you have to get better at your searches. It took me a couple times there. Okay, cancel. Not interested in doing that. This looks good. Save that, right? Go back to our instructions, and... That was step 10. So let's continue on to step number 11. We are just rocking and rolling. Okay, so it's step 11 says to complete the calculations, you will use the fill handle to copy the previously created functions. Uh, use the fill handle to copy the functions from range B16 through B21 across to B16 and even to D21. So we're really going across two columns. So let's do that. I'm going to go back to Excel. 
and here are my functions. Now these functions were focused on house cost. Now I want to do the same thing for down payment. I want to do the same thing for amount financed. In other words, I want to have a total down payment, average down payment, median, same with amount finance. So I select that. That first cell is already selected. Don't be fooled. Get my fill handle, my autofill handle. Powerful black plus sign when I'm in the right position. Press and drag across both columns. Look at that. Let's check. Click on this one. What am I looking for? Did it change to column C? And it did. Did it change to column D? And it did. Are the rows, you know, are the values right? Because it should, shouldn't it still be C8 through C12? You know, if I click, look how Excel is helping me. I like that. This is escape not delete, so you can do that. So if you want to click inside the formula, just don't change anything. Be very cautious, right? But look how it's saying, yep, still that. Excellent. That looks good. And how quick and how easy was that? You're going home. People who are using their cell phones as calculators to type up those numbers, oh, they got a long day in front of them. And then something will change. You're using formulas, so your spreadsheet will change automatically. Let's save that. Back to the instructions. That was step 11. Oh, look, speaking of change, here comes a change. Step 12. You would like to test the functions you created by editing one of the values in the worksheet. So we're going to change the value in B9 to 425,000. Note the results of the formula are now updated. So let's go back to Excel. They said the value in B9. And this house is gone up in price. So I just click that cell. I'm going to just start typing 425,000, 425,000. Now, <clears throat> look down below. I haven't hit enter yet. So I'm looking down here because I want to watch and I want to see what changes. Oops, did you see it? In fact, first of all, the uh, percent financed changed. And then my house cost changed. Now, down payment did not change. Those values are still the same. But amount financed changed, right? Wow, that was so quick. Excellent. Save. Let's go back to the instructions. Ah, step 13. It's a good practice, it says, to insert the date in a worksheet containing financial information. You will use the today function to insert the current date. Now this is key. It means it will always display the current date. It does not mean that it will display the current date and then two weeks from now it will still display today's date. Now every time you open this, it will display today's date. Sometimes that's handy if you're printing something because you want to make sure that it displays displays the date that it was printed. So this can be a very handy function. What is a function? It's just a program that the computer uses. So it says use the today function to insert the current date in cell B4. Let's go back to Excel. They've told us the function, so we know it. If we didn't know it, there's two things. We could go to AutoSum. We could use more functions, and we could search for it. or we could go over here. Do you see this little scripty f of x? That is called the insert function button. And it will pull up that cell. I'm going to click it just so you can see. Uh, no, let me get to I'm sorry. Let me click here where we're supposed to be before. Now I'm going to click this. And isn't this the same search box that we saw when we went under uh, more functions? So I could search for the today function. You know, let, let's just say I, I do that. It says here it is. And look at what they're telling us. This is what the function needs. That looks like a zero. It's not. It's an open parenthesis and a closed parenthesis right next to each other. You know how we know that? Because we know functions have to have parentheses. It returns the current date formatted as a date. Well, I'm just going to click cancel for a moment because I want you to see how to enter a function. I'm about to do math. What do I have to do? as I do math. Power up, equal sign, right? All formulas begin with a equal sign. Now we're going to use a function in our formula. And what did they tell us the function is? Today. We just type the word today. All functions have parentheses. So I'm going to open my parenthesis. In our previous functions, 
for summing, for averaging, min, max, count. We put something inside the parentheses because the program required it. If you want me to sum something, the program says, pass me what you want me to sum. Okay, and you put that inside the parentheses. You want me to count something, pass me the cell values of what you want me to count. Well, in the today function, what does it need? What, should, what do we need to pass it? Nothing. It does not require what they call arguments, it parameters, options, details. We call them arguments. It does not need any arguments and therefore close the parenthesis. All, form, all formulas start with an equal sign. In this formula, we're going to use a function. The function is today. All functions have parentheses. Open, close, press enter. Isn't that cool? Every time you open this spreadsheet, the most current date will display. Because the date has not been typed in here, the function has. Save that. Go back to the instructions. Look at this, we're on to step 14 and we are nearly done. Now, I do wanna remind you at the start of this video, I talked to you about what the function that we're gonna see here called XLOOKUP and how it's only available in the most current Excel 2021 version, okay? And some options that you have if you are using an older version and why that's important because we're teaching the current version, right? Plus, you're going to love this function. Gosh, it is so powerful. I encourage you to look at this. Okay, so what does it want? It says you would like to use a lookup function. In other words, I'm going to tell Excel, go look up this. Go look up that. And it's going to go look it up for me. We're going to look up on the payment info worksheet to deter, so different worksheet, payment info worksheet, to determine the annual percentage rate of homes finance based on the lookup table in the range D4 through E6. We're going to have to kind of break this down. So I could read all this to you. It, it's trying to tell you, what are you looking up? You're looking up the value of, uh, in uh, F9. Here's where you're looking it up. Here's what you want it to return. Um, be sure to use absolute absolute two dollar signs absolute cell references and then we're going to copy that formula so let's just kind of do it together I'm going back to excel okay and in excel i've got a change to this new worksheet payment info okay so i'm on this new worksheet and we're going to start in cell g9 is that what they told us yes cell g9 this x lookup function is brand new. And for me, you know, Excel 2021 is kind of brand new. So I'm not familiar with this function. I would like Excel to help me a little bit. So I'm going to use this insert function button. And I know the name of the function, so I'm just going to search for it by name. X lookup. You can either press enter or click go, either way. Look, look at what it's doing. It says, here's what you need. Here's the parentheses. And you're going to have to give it. Notice all these are in bold. You're going to have to give it a lot of information. Fear and anxiety release. We're going to just step into it. We're going to find out what it does. And we're going to like it. Look at this, too. You will like this. If you click on this help function, it's so cool because it even includes, I'm going to click on it just to show you. It, it will open up this. There's oftentimes videos. Look at that. And it's going to explain that function to you. I'm also remember including resources in the comments where um, that, that will provide you some extra help. So Googling, you know, is a great thing, right? Google is your friend. So XLOOKUP, click on OK because I'm telling it I want some help. Now look at this. It's a, I'm moving this over so that we can see our table as well as this box. Three of these are in bold, so I know that they're required. Two of these are optional, and so we'll cross those bridges when we get there. Down below here, every time I click, it's going to tell me what I'm supposed to put in here. Okay, so it's explaining each one of these arguments, each one of these arguments. So I'm clicking where it says lookup table, and it says this is the value to search for. Well, they told us, what did they tell us? F9. So here I'm going to click F9. Now, I want to pause and think as I go. 
I'm going to copy this formula. When I copy it down to the row below, do I want F9 to change to F10? Yes. So on and so on. So do I need to make that absolute? No. I think that's good as it is. And it's even telling me you've chosen this value 25. Okay. Look up array. Is the array or range to search? Well, they told me to search D4 through D6. So I can type it if I want, but I prefer with my uh, insertion point next to this, 4. Sorry, do that correctly. D4 through D6. So let's think what's happening. I'm telling it, look up 25 years. Where do you look it up? You look it up here. Because what is it that you want me to return? I want you to return the rate. Change to return array, and I'm going to pick the rate. Okay. Now, we've taken two important steps here. We've said, what am I going to look up? I'm going to look up this, you know, 25 years. Where am I going to look it up? In the lookup array, right here. What am I going to return? I'm going to return here. But we're asking ourselves at each step, I'm going to copy this formula. Do I want it to change F9, F10, F11? Yes. Do I want this to change, D4 through D6? Do I want that to scoot down when I copy the formula and say D5 through D7? No. So this has to be absolute. How do I make it absolute? I'm going to put that dollar sign. And they didn't say a mixed reference. They said an absolute. So I need two dollar signs on each cell. And do you see how I'm just, and I've got to be very precise here. Oops, goodness, if I can type. Right? And I'm going to do the same for the return array because I don't want this to change from E4 through E6. I want it to lock on to those cells because I'm going to copy this formula. So I need to prepare for that. I'm just using my arrow keys and then typing that dollar sign. Okay. Now, look, it's already telling us the answer. And so we can kind of spot check that because for 25 years, if I looked here, wouldn't that be 3.6% expressed as a number, 0 0.036? Yes. So I feel good that that is the correct answer. Now, what about these others? If it's not found, it says return if no match is found. In other words, what if I put in here 27 years? That's not one of the options. So what do they tell us about that? Do they tell us anything? Be sure to use the appropriate cell referencing. They don't give us any further information about this. So we're going to assume the default. By default, this is if you are a VLOOKUP user, this is different with XLOOKUP. By default, XLOOKUP assumes an exact match. I'll tell you something else that you need to always make sure of with, with any time you have a lookup value. Do you notice that this is sorted? In other words, it's not like 25 years, 15 years, and then 30 years, because Excel is going to look down this list as you and I would and expect it to be in you know ascending order. Okay, so it needs to be sorted so that it knows when I pass 15, you know, my next stop is 25, right? So they need, it needs to be logical. So by default, it's going to return an exact match. Uh, so we can leave that blank. Match mode, specify how to match lookup values against values in the lookup array. We're going to leave that also blank and accept the default. I have to say off the top of my head, I've forgotten that one, but I've given you some great resources where you can look at that. Click OK. Now, remember, my goal is now to copy that formula, and I've put my absolute references in, so let's copy that. I'm going to spot check it absolutely. F11, F10, F13, but the other values are locked in place. Does this make sense for 30 years? Is it 3.75? It is. For 30 years, yes. For 15 years, yes. Right? Everything looks correct. Save that. Isn't that powerful, though? I mean, we could change this if the person said, no, 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 not 25 years. I meant 15 years. Watch the APR. It updated it, right? It updated it. I put it back to 25. It updated it. So it's looking that up in that table. Let's continue on. We just have a little bit further. We should save that good work. 
and let's go back to the instructions. So here we are, step 15, we're in that homing stretch. It says next you will calculate the total payment for each mortgage financed. Use the payment function, PMT, payment function, in cell H9 to calculate. Here's a key word, folks, monthly payments. It's key because the information that they've given us on this spreadsheet, which we're going to look at in just a moment, is annual. It's annual interest rate, for example. So if we're going to calculate monthly payments, we need to make sure that all of the arguments that we're going to use, all of our information in our formula is based on monthly so that the answer is monthly, right? We have to keep those units of measure the same. So monthly payments based on the APR, which is annual percentage rate. In cell G9, we're going to look at the years financed in cell F9. Now, it's monthly payments, though, years financed. Oh, that we might need to think about that in terms of how many months is it financed and the amount financed, of course, in cell D9. Couple other key pieces of information here ensure that the final value is positive. Now, why would they say that? By default, when, when you owe somebody money, you're in the hole, you're in the red. There's a little minus sign there for that IOU. You're in debt, right? So debt is a negative number. But when we talk about how much debt we have, we don't say we have negative a thousand dollars debt on our credit card. We just say we have a thousand dollars debt. The credit card company says you owe us a thousand dollars. They don't say you owe us negative a thousand dollars, right? It would kind of be strange. So the payment function is very proper in the sense that it is going to return a negative number, but just because we don't speak of it in that way, they want us to ensure that this is a final, the final value is positive. Well, how do we do that? How do you turn any negative number into a positive? You just turn that frown upside down. No, no. Um, you, you multiply it by negative one, right? You just multiply it by a negative. Two negatives make a positive. So that's what we're going to do. And it says use the appropriate absolute cell references. Why? Because we're going to copy that formula that we create to the other cells in that column. So we need to be thinking ahead about those absolute cell references. So let's get started. Let's go to our spreadsheet. We're here in cell H9. This is where we're going to calculate the monthly payments. They told me to use the payment function. Whenever I can, I like to get Excel to help me with that. So I'm going to go up here to this paste or the insert, I'm sorry, insert function. It used to be called the paste function. Insert function, never mind, insert function. Now here's my insert function dialog box. It's way over here. If yours is on top, just point at that title bar, move it out of the way so you can see. The function that they've told me is PMT. So I'm going to type that, press enter. Many payment functions that Excel can calculate for us. This one says calculates the payment for a loan based on constant payments and a constant interest rate. So not applicable for a variable interest rate loan, which some people do. If you need help, you know how to do that. Click on that help function and excellent, excellent help. Click OK. With my dialog box open, again, I'm just moving it out of the way. I have three required arguments and two that are optional. So three, I definitely need to put in a value. When we talk about optional arguments, what this means is that there is a default. So it will make an assumption um, in, in you can use the help to try to find that out on various functions. Uh, and in our case, if the instructions didn't tell us what to provide for these optional arguments, then we know we can just leave those blank. But I need to fill in the rate. So it says the rate is the interest rate per period. So we're doing monthly payments, okay? It says, for example, if your APR what they are assuming here, is 6%. You divide by 4. See how they did that? For quarterly payments, okay, at the 6% APR. So what is our APR? Well, our APR is here in cell G9. 
right? Now, I need to divide this by the number of payments. And I could, just like they did, I could type divide and then 12 so that I convert this from yearly to monthly. But remember, on my spreadsheet here, we already have that. Here's the number of payments per year. And in that way, if it changes, I don't have to change it in each and every one of my formulas. I can just change it here in the cell, and all my formulas will be updated with that new value. So G9 divided by, don't forget to put divided by, and I'm going to click B5. Now, are we ready to move on to the next argument? I don't know, because G9, as we copy this formula down, we know we're going to do that. We want that to change, G10, G11, G12, so that one's okay. But B5, we want to lock on to that cell. So how do we do that? You know, you are experts at it now. You're going to put that dollar sign before the letter B, and you're going to put that dollar sign before the row 5. If you are asking yourself right now, sh could I, should I put the dollar sign only before the row because the column is not changing, I'm just going to copy this down. In other words, could I do a mixed reference? You could, except for our instructions, very specifically tell us to do absolute reference. If you want kind of a pro tip of how do we normally do this in the real world, I use absolute references unless I just really have a need for a mixed reference because I want to be really clear that I need it to be locked on to that particular cell. Okay, so best practice is probably to do absolute reference unless you know you need a mixed reference. Next argument, n per. n per is the total number of payments for the loan. Well, what are the total number of payments? Is it 25 years? Well, that is how many years I'm going to be making payments, but I'm going to be paying every month. So once again, I need to use this value in B5, but I need to multiply. So F9 times B5, and I know by this point that I need to lock that down with an absolute reference. You may be wondering, why don't I have to type an equal sign at the front of this? It's because if you'll look here in the formula bar, that equal sign is already there. It's before the function. So as soon as we clicked on this function, this insert function button, Excel went ahead and typed that equal sign for us. Even though we're doing math inside of that function, we're already in this math mode, and so we don't need another equal sign. Students do get confused on that, so I want to point that out. There's not an additional equal sign at this point, because we're already in that calculator. Next argument is PV. PV is the present value, the total amount that a series of future payments is worth now. So PV, what we're really saying is, what is the value of the loan right now? Well, we have the cost of the house, but we're not getting a loan for the entire cost of the house. We're, we've had the down payment, and we had to subtract that. So we're only financing this amount in D9. See that in D9. So I've put D9 there. Now, I have not submitted this to the grader yet. So I don't know, you know, if this is right or wrong. I, I really don't. But um, there's kind of two ways that we could approach this. We could finish the entire payment function and then multiply it by negative 1. Or we could just make this present value a, a negative. You see what I did there? I could just put negative in front of D9. Another way I could approach this, and the reason I've thought about all these is because I'm not sure what the grader, the automatic grader, is looking for. I could also say D9 times negative 1. Couldn't I do that? 
So there are a lot of ways that I can make this negative. Not sure what the grader is looking for. If it marks me wrong, what am I going to do? I'm going to look at it. It's going to say this is wrong and it'll probably suggest to me what it should be and I'll fix it. So it's already telling me this is what my monthly payment is going to be. Whew, that's a lot of money, but that looks like a big house. So with this kind of big house comes a large house payment. So I'll agree with that. Click OK. There it is and it looks so nice. I click on that formula again. I just want to double check it. Is it ready to be copied? I think it is. So I'm going to put my mouse over that autofill handle. Get that powerful black plus sign. Press and drag. You know the drill. I'm going to click. I'm going to be looking up here just to make sure that especially that first value, I might really look at it. I might really look here about where it says F11 right now, D11. If I spot check those values, because the other ones should not be changing. It looks good. We did a lot of hard work. Let's save that. Looks like we have one more column to complete. And if I'm not mistaken, if we go back to our instructions, we have one more step. So let's just jump in and do it. So step 16, almost there, almost finished. For the last step, till, until we submit, for the last step, you will determine the monthly personal mortgage insurance, or PMI, if applicable. Hmm, so it's not always applicable. So how can we determine, you know, how can we calculate it then? Because we don't want to calculate it if it's not applicable. It says since not all mortgages require PMI, we are going to use a new function called the IF function. You are going to love this. This is one of the most frequently used functions, you know, aside from some, right? You're going to love the IF function. It says enter the if function in cell I9. That has to be a letter I because it's column and then row. So I9 to determine the monthly PMI if applicable. The mortgage requires PMI if the percent of down payment is less than 20%. And they actually give us a little cautionary note right here. They say, look at cell B7. Let's just look at that very quickly to understand what we're talking about. So I'm going to go back to the spreadsheet. And I'm, I'm looking in this monthly PMI column. This is where I'm going to do my calculation. But what am I going to use in this calculation? And it said cell B7. Well, look at this. It says down payment rate. 20%. So what they're telling us here is that they have put on their worksheet the value that requires the PMI insurance. It's really nice that they did that because we know that we're going to copy that formula. We may use this formula hundreds of times. And if the rules and regulations change and it, tomorrow it's going to be 25% or the day after it's going to be 15%. If this changes, then all we have to do is come to this one place, change the percentage, and all of our formulas will be updated automatically. So it's a really good practice to go ahead and put that on your worksheet instead of putting it inside the formula. Okay. Now, while we're here, we're talking about the percentage of down payment right? And what we're really talking about is here's our down payment, 86000 and here's the total cost of the house. And so we could calculate that as part of our PMI if statement. But I see that I have other values here. And if I click on a cell, now I'm going to click in the formula. Remember when you do that, that you are editing the formula. So don't click on cells around here because you might modify your formula. But I'm doing that because it is telling me here are the two values. Look at that C9 divided by B9. Well, we could put that in our PMI, but it's already done that for us, right? They've already calculated that. So I'm going to use this value, E9, in my formula. Folks, this is where you want to use one of the skills that you learned in the first grader that I told you about to quickly display all the formulas on your worksheet. 
do you remember the keystroke? This is the control key and that key with the little tick mark, the little apostrophe to the left of the number one. One reason I use this key so frequently is because remember if I do it once, it shows me the formulas. If I do it again, oops, if I do it again, it takes that formula, it puts it back to the results. But if I was in real life working on this, I would click in this, you know, I9, and I'd go, oh, I think they calculated that for me. What do I have here? Oh, okay, okay, I can see, okay, okay, okay. And then I go back to working. Because I can very quickly see those formulas just by using that toggle, control, what shall we call that? It's not really an apostrophe um, because that's over next to the enter key. Ugh. It's, you know, anyway, so you know the one that I'm talking about when you see the number signs across, the numbers across the top, one, two, three, four, five. It's that key to the left of the number one. You want to hold your control key down, touch that. To go back, hold your control key down, touch that again, like the uh, apostrophe mark that you, there. Okay, so now that I have, I understand that I have these values here, I just need to write the if statement. Let's just make sure we have all the instructions. We understand B7. We also understand that we already have this um, percentage calculated. It says if the mortgage, <coughs> it says if the mortgage requires PMI, then PMI is going to be 0.38%. So don't overlook that point there, 0.38% of the amount financed. Be sure to use the appropriate absolute cell references for the input values, and then use the fill handle to copy that function. So they're going ahead and telling us don't use a mixed reference, use absolute. Again, that's really the default of what I would use unless I knew I needed to use a mixed reference because we are planning to copy that formula. So let's get to it, back to the spreadsheet. And I want to go ahead and point out one other number. Did you notice last time we were here that they also had this PMI rate? Interesting that they didn't tell us about the cell that time, right? So we, of course, are going to reference that cell in our formula. So I'm going to start. I'm going to click in cell I9. And I want Excel to help me with this if statement. So I'm going to click on that insert function. And if your dialog box is, you know, sitting on top of your work, just point to that title bar and move it to the side. Now, if is one of those functions we use frequently. You may already see it down here in your functions list. But I'm going to type if. Uh, I'm going to press the Enter key. And that sorted and filtered this so that I have only those with if. And there are many because it's a very useful function. This is the one I want. And it tells me if, and then there's my parentheses, and it says I have three arguments. A logical test, a value if true, and a value if false. Hmm. So this checks whether a condition is met and it returns one value if true and another value if false. And that's exactly what we want because we only want to calculate monthly PMI if the down payment is less than 20%. So let's click on OK. Again, my dialog box is helping me. Now, this is interesting. Look at this. It says the only thing that is required is the logical test. Well, first of all, we would only be using this if function if we had, you know, options. We wanted one thing to happen or another thing to happen. But here's the thing. If I make a logical test, now what is a logical test? A logical test is any value or expression that can be evaluated as true or false. You say, um, I'm going to ask you a true or false question. 2 plus 2 equals 4. True or false? That's, that's what the logical test is, right? We're going to give it a math equation. Now, don't be freaked out by math because it just simply means something like 2 plus 2. The math question in our case is, is this down payment less than 20%? 
that's either going to be true or false. Well, let's think through this. If it's true, I need to go ahead and calculate PMI times the amount financed, right? I think that's, is that what they said? Yeah, times the amount financed. What if it's false? Really, I don't have to do anything, right? So, um, you know, so that is optional in the sense that I want one thing to happen if it's true, but I don't really want to do anything if it's false. Now, what if I had, some of you savvy folks are asking, what if I had asked the question the other way? What if instead of asking it like they said, if the percent of down payment is less than 20%, what if I had asked the question, is the percent of down payment greater than 20%? Well, then I might have a condition, if false, then if it's greater, then I need to calculate. And if true, I would do nothing. Now, I don't mean to confuse you. My point is that you can have situations where only you're only going to enter one of these values, either a true response or a false response. Okay, but I didn't mean to get into the tall grass there. Let's get back on track. What is the question we are asking? Well, our logical test has to do with this value in E9. We want to know is E9, and we're going to ask it the way the instructions said, less than, and then remember they cautioned us to use cell B7. So is, is the uh, percent down, E9, less than the down payment rate? And look, Excel is already telling us the answer. False, right? Okay, well, if that was not the case, well, first of all, are we ready to look at the next argument? Mm-mm, almost got caught up in that. I know I'm going to have to copy this in a minute. So E9 is going to become E10, E11, E12. I'm okay with that. But B7, I want to lock onto that cell absolutely lock it on. Dollar before the column, dollar before the row, absolutely. Absolute reference. So if that's true, then we need to calculate. So here I, I'm clicked down here where it says true. My PMI rate times the amount financed. In this case, D9. Now look at that for a minute. I'm going to copy this formula. The first thing I clicked was cell B6. That's the one I want locked. You know, you might have clicked these in a different order, so make sure you're working with cell B6 and that you absolutely lock on to cell B6. Two dollar signs. D9, the amount financed, is going to change. So it, it is relative, relative to where the formula is. Now, what do I do if the value is false? Well, they didn't tell us. They didn't tell us. So if I click OK, I'm going to go ahead and do that. This is what is going to display. Hmm, you know, uh, this is again, I haven't submitted this, and this is a brand new chapter, uh, or you know, brand new textbook ebook this year, brand new version of the software. So I'm not sure what the grader is going to tell us. It might be okay with displaying this word false. It might have preferred that I display a zero there. I'm not sure what it wants. We're going to have to see what the grader wants. Um, if I want to make changes to this, I can click on this cell I9, and I can just click that insert function again. And a really nice thing about this is that Excel recognizes that there is a function in that uh, cell, and it, it repopulates this dialog box, so it makes it really easy for us to edit within this dialog box. For example, if instead I wanted the value to just simply display zero, uh, then I could do that and click OK. And sometimes that's how Excel, that's a formatting uh, thing. 
that Excel may display just a little dash. You can see why an accountant would never want that to be a negative sign, right? Which do you think? You think we should use zero here? Or do you think that we should just let it display false because they did not tell us what to do if it was false? Hmm. You know, uh, I'm going to I'm going to keep zero in there and you'll see at the end when we submit this. And if I'm wrong, then I'll put a note on the videos to help you get the maximum points. That's what I want. Now, I think I'm ready to copy this formula. I'm going to put my mouse over that autofill handle, get that powerful black plus sign, press and drag. And if I spot check that compared to my percent down payment, this one is less than 20%. This one is less than 20%. And for those, I must pay this additional insurance cost. Okay, save that. Save that beautiful work. I'm starting to cross my fingers as we come back to the instructions because step 17 says submit. So let's see. You know the rules here, folks. I close everything. I want you out of Excel, okay? Just get out of everything. Don't try to keep it open while you submit. Also, what else is important? I'm going to close the instructions. I'm going to make sure I've saved that, close that. Make sure you know where your files are. Mine are in my Excel 2 folder on my desktop. Make sure you know where yours are. I'm going to pause the video while I go into the submission. For me, it's going directly to the web browser, My IT Lab. Hopefully, folks, hopefully you are submitting this through your online course in pause. And if so, make sure you follow the instructions for submitting through pause. I wanted to show you this because I've mentioned several times that I am working these instructions to um, have them prepared for you when we start the semester with this new book and system in fall 2022. But I am a little ahead, and so materials are still being released. And so the system's actually been down for a couple days as they have been updating because they are also trying to get ready for you. But I wanted you to notice this, that they said the IT-based courses are still unavailable. Um, so I was a little worried and still am just a little bit worried. I wanted to show you this message here. I was a little worried, but I was able to log in, but my fingers are crossed. Um, in hopes that everything does grade and process correctly because I really would like some feedback on this. So I've downloaded, of course, the files. I'm going to choose the file to upload. Uh, look at that. Watch out, folks. I'm in the wrong folder, Excel 1. Let's make sure we go to the desktop. In my case, it's desktop in Excel 2. Pick that file that begins with your last name. Open. Not done. Upload. Make sure you get successful upload. Yes. Ooh, my fingers are crossed. Submit for grading. I'm giving it just a minute. Okay, I have some errors in here. 91.2, not bad, but I want to know what did I do wrong. So let's click on uh, the view submissions. And I'm going to click on that submission. And let's go down and find what we did wrong, what I did wrong. Oh, look at that. I bet it was what we talked about with that zero in there. Do you think that's what it was? That took a lot of points off. Goodness. Yeah, because look, it affected so many cells. So let's look at that. It says in the cell I9, the formula was not set. Oh, but they didn't say that. You know, the instructions are being updated. I tell you what I see immediately. Okay, in cell I9, for the payment info, the formula was not set to if. Well, I did have if. E9, we did use E9. And look at this. It's saying if E9 is greater than or equal to. Can you see that? Greater than or equal to B7. Well... They asked, first of all, asked the question a little differently, didn't they? 
they asked the question the opposite way. And and so that's why they they didn't say less than. They didn't say if E9 is less than. They said if E9 is greater than or equal to. So that's a different way of asking the question. Now I know, right? Now I know. And I'll look at that. If that's true, then that means they don't need to pay PMI. So they did put the zero in there. And if it's false, now look at what they did here. They took D9 times B6 divided by B5. Okay, and that seems to have affected all of these cells. Yes, okay. So I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to make very, very sure that I, I'm going to copy that. And I'm going to make very sure that I enter that in the way that the grader is, you know, is wanting to, to do that. Uh, this is where I, you know, you can write it down. I tend to paste it into something like Notepad so that I can easily refer back to it. So I, I wanted you to know that. I'm going to move this off to the side, but we're going to come back to that. Now, was that the only issue? If so, I actually feel pretty good about that. It's just a difference in how they ask the question. I am interested in the last part of that calculation. Okay, so far so good. Let's go back. And I'm going to actually, uh, let me get out of this. I'm just minimizing it. And let me go back to my uh, spreadsheet. Now, I want to fix the first formula, you know, not pick and choose. I want to go right back to the beginning and I'm going to click on the insert function because that'll help me type this out just a little better. So here's the difference. I asked, the way I formulated the question is I said if E9 is, oops, and see how click when I'm editing that formula, look what just happened. It added something. Take that out. I said if E9 is less than B7, well, that was not the way that they wanted to ask the question. They wanted to ask the question. Here it is here. I just brought this in so you can see it. They wanted to ask the question, is E9 greater than or equal to? And do you see how they put both symbols? That's how you say both. You know, we don't have the ability to do like a, a greater than it with that little underline symbol that you would write by hand. So we just put them side by side both symbols side by side. That means greater than or equal to. So I'm going to change my way of thinking here so that the greater can understand greater than or equal. So now look at that. Instead of false, it's true. It is true. This is greater than 20.2%. Very important. So that means what do I do if that is true? Well, according to what they've explained to me, I do not need to calculate this PMI. My PMI would be zero, so I'm just going to put zero as the true value. But what if that value is false? Now, I'm going to pull this up here. I'm going to delete the zero, and I'm going to bring back what they wrote. This is what they wrote, and let's just look at it. They said... Okay, if it's greater, and so we don't need this PMI, then D9, which is what the amount financed, times B6, which is the P, uh, okay, because they're going to calculate, which is the PMI rate, <sighs> divided, divided by B5, oh, I made a, a mistake and I would not have thought about that without the greater. You, look what they divided it by. So this PMI rate is an annual rate and I forgot to convert that to monthly and everything we're doing you know from this point monthly payments to the right is monthly. So I should have made that conversion and I didn't. So let's do that now. Let me bring this back down. So if percent down payment is greater than or equal to B7, so if it's even just 20%, I don't have to pay that uh, 
that PMI. So if that's true, if it's greater than or equal, then zero PMI. But if it's false, then I need to take D9, which is the amount financed. I'm going to go ahead and click on that. D9 times B6. Now, thinking ahead for a minute, I know that I'm going to copy this. So let me just right now, before I forget, lock that cell. Two dollar signs, absolute reference. B6 divided by, because I need to convert this to that number of periods, because it even, look at the title, even says monthly PMI. Okay, so I'm going to divide by B5. Now, B5 is another cell that when I copy this, I don't want this moving on me, so I need to lock that down. One additional note of caution uh, as we look at this. Let me see if I can bring this back up here. Move all my things around. Remember this, PEMDAS? What is going to happen first, second, does it matter? Okay. In this case, it's going to execute correctly because we have multiply and then we have divide and so this is it, it's it's going to the answer is going to work out correctly but it would not hurt if you were confused in the real world and you said uh, let me kind of group this together let me for example uh, put parentheses around b6 and b5 so that i recognize with clear communication that i am converting this pmi rate to a monthly rate that would not change the outcome of your equation now i'm not going to do it because i don't want the i think the grader is not expecting that so um, we know what it needs to be i'm sharing that with you but we also are cognizant that the order of operations does matter that hierarchy matters okay now that does look reasonable 107. yeah that was a big that was a big payment if it was monthly i wasn't looking at that so let's say okay so i fixed the first payment which actually it still reflects the same value, doesn't it? Let me copy this. You're going to see some changes for those two that are there. Whew. <laughs> That's much better, right, than those big 600 numbers. That was a big monthly payment, but in fact it was annual. So good thing that now we've divided that by 12. And we've asked the question in the way that the grader wanted. It actually would kind of be interesting to know if I uh, had remembered to divide by 12, you know, or to divide by the number of payments, would the grader still have marked it correctly? I want to give a shout out to Pearson and the amazing things that they do with the simulation as well as the grader because I want you to understand that you can accomplish things in more than one way and they can still be it can still be graded correctly so kind of feel comfortable in that but if there's an error you've got me telling you how to do it you've got the grader letting you know when you've made a mistake so you have lots and lots of support I hope you feel that save this is about learning that's what this is about close out of it get out of it I close everything let's go back I'm going to submit this again again if you have the ability to submit this through pause if that's what you've been instructed to do please do uh, I'm going to pause for a minute while I get back to where I need to get to so let's submit again we're hoping for that 100 we've learned through the process Success. Submit. <gasps> Yay! So two submissions. We saw the error. We fixed the error. We submitted again. And we have that 100%. As a reminder, if you're running into problems and when you look at the error, I'm going to go back to this first one that had the errors. When you look at this, if you're not able to uh, understand what it's saying in the scorecard, I really recommend that you use live comment reports because the live comment report 
You see, it just down now. I'm in Chrome, and uh, if you're in uh, Edge, Microsoft, it put it in your Downloads folder. So go to your Downloads folder and open that li LC for Live Comments Report. I'm just enabling editing on the first worksheet, and you're an Excel user now, so you totally get this. On this first worksheet, it's telling you an overview what's happened, and then if you click Details. Look at this. This was our details. It's perfect. No problems there, but I'm going to continue on to payment info. This is where it's telling me. You've got errors, and it's telling me, see how when I'm just hovering over that, and it's telling me exactly what happened, and it's telling me exactly how I need to correct it, and it's, it's uh, relational. I can see where. I don't have to try to figure things out. So you may really like this live comments report. Okay, keep that in mind. All right, folks, thank you. I know this was another long video. I appreciate you so much. And um, go out there and get that 100.